to welcome you to the class here that is about an overview of Autodesk Mobflow Insight. We're going to look at really the user interface. We're going to look at the mesh, different mesh types, what a uh, good quality mesh is. We'll look at process setup. We'll dig into results as well and interpretation, really understanding kind of what the results show or possibly what they don't show. I will also talk about if you have questions beyond this class when you're using software. And I just want to end with a little bit about what other technologies are available within Moleflow besides just injection molding. So my name is Tim Van Ast. I am a principal implementation consultant. I've been with Autodesk for a little over four years, but I've been a customer before joining Autodesk for, for over 20 years. So really, I'm very passionate about Moldflow, about helping customers to learn, understand, and implement Moldflow, really to see the value that, that I've seen from the software for a lot of years. So to start with, let's, let's look at software here, and I will be sort of bouncing back and forth between software and PowerPoints here, but we wanna start out with the interface, right? If you're new to Moldflow Insight, we'll start at the very basics here. So Moldflow Insight, if you've installed it on your computer, you will find most likely on your desktop, you'll find an M with a little I on there. A few things to note, if you've installed it, you might also find one with an M with a little C, which would actually be for Moleflow Communicator, which is sort of a results output that anybody can view as long as they have Moleflow Communicator, which is a free download. But a few things to note, if you're looking in your start menu and you're trying to find Moleflow Insight, what you'll actually find for buttons to click is Moleflow Synergy. So a quick note of that, when you install Moleflow, there are two installs. One is Moleflow Synergy, which is actually the interface. It's everything you see and do and touch. And the second installation is Moleflow Insight. That is actually the solver. And they are two separate installations. And the great thing is if something were to happen and Synergy, the interface, were to crash, Insight would still be solving in the background and any jobs that you have running wouldn't actually die. They would continue to run you can simply open up Insight Synergy and off you go. But so just so you're aware, there are two separate programs that are actually going. Even though we call it Insight, it's Synergy is what we see and use whenever we touch the software. So it is a single environment, pre and post processing. It's all in the same software. And we'll look at this. In fact, I'll probably uh, just break off in just a minute into the software. But we've got a few things, right? The environment toolbar, the display window where we see our part, We've got log files, we've got the project files, uh, study tasks, layers, and notes. So now I'd say is a perfect time. Let's hop over here and let's look at this. Now I already have a project started with some studies in there, but let's assume that we're gonna start a, a new one. So I'm gonna go ahead and import to start with and we're gonna find the file we're looking for. It's gonna come up here. You can say okay to here. Really, the only option that I ever change is what mesh types that I would like to eventually end up with. At this point, it doesn't really matter. I can change it once I'm in software as well. So in this case, I'm actually going to switch to dual domain. And coming up in a little bit, I'll describe what the difference between a mid-plane mesh, a dual domain mesh, and a solid 3D mesh is. So we'll start with that. One of the things that I didn't mention there that you can look at is the available file types that we can import. You know, step file is what this one is. That's sort of the universal solid translation out of any CAD software. But really just know that actually, you know, Moleflow can import most native or, or at least the, the major native, native CAD packages directly. So if it's a Creo part or a CATIA or a SolidWorks part, you can actually import the, the native file directly. If for some reason that might not work or you don't have access to that, a step file is probably the most common one that's used to import. So we see our part here. One thing of note that's a little more beyond the interface, but I mention it now because I've always gotten into the habit of doing this when it first comes in. One of the things Moleflow wants to see and needs to see is the orientation of our part. The mold open and close direction needs to follow the Z axis. So here we see a Z. If I rotate this a little, this tells me mold open and close needs to be in this direction. In this case, I see it is properly aligned. If it weren't, I would need to go to either geometry or mesh tab and do a rotate in order to rotate my part, say 90 degrees in the X. Maybe that would now put it in Z being open close. Uh, again, in this case, it was correct. But that's one of the things I always want to do when I first import my part. So if we look at the interface then, again, 
clearly here is our, our, our model. Here's where we get to see everything that we're gonna do and touch. The M in the top corner, this is sort of the start button for Moleflow. Here we have a lot of things like, you know, new project, new files, new studies, open, save, export, publish, print, that type of stuff. The other thing we'll see is there's a lot of other files here. These were the previously used projects that I had used. Also search commands. If I'm up here, especially if you're new to the software, if I'm looking for something like, uh, where did that merge node or is it global merge, whatever, if I type something in there, it gives me sort of uh, breadcrumbs here to sort of see, hey, where is it? Okay, so it's the mesh tab and it's the mesh edit panel and then merge nodes or wherever that is. So that's a pretty slick way, again, especially if you're kind of getting used to MoFlow to find commands if you can't seem to find them where they naturally are. The other thing here is the options button. So if I click the options, here we get to, I guess what I would call, well, software options, software preferences, settings, whatever you'd like to call it. But this is where we get to the settings for the software. There aren't a lot that I change here, but I'll point out a few that I do. Things like auto save, you know, it's always annoying when you get the little wheel of weight while you're just like, ah, oh, I was about to do something and all of a sudden it's saving. But that also can save your bacon for sure when you've worked on something for a half an hour and all of a sudden, you know, power goes out, software goes down, something like that. So you can set that here. You can also set units, whatever your default units you want to see here. There's another place I will show you here in just a second. We can do that. Uh, so the one thing here is directories. So here you can set your default project directory. I think the default values that show up when you install the software is usually your user folder. And more and more user folders aren't actually located on their local machine. A lot of times they're up on a network somewhere. And I'll just give you a hint here. Moleflow generally doesn't like to be working on files when they're stored on a network it'll get some lag based on network speed and can potentially give you some errors if there's a glitch in network speed sort of as you're doing something. So I re highly recommend you do it local. And then once you do that, it just makes it simpler to, to, to find your files all in one location. The other one that's really huge is the mouse tab. Here I can actually set a lot of different settings for my mouse as far as rotate, pan, dynamic zoom. And this really is the place you can help yourself out by setting your mouse settings so that they match whatever CAD system or other program you're used to using. Moleflow has their defaults, but you know, go with whatever you're used to. For me, I set pan in the middle and rotate on the right mouse button. I also set mouse apply by using a control button and center of rotation by the middle with the control button. So by doing that, I can kind of use a lot of stuff just with mouse without having to click the specific buttons elsewhere. The one other thing that I will show here on the options is in results. If you're looking at a result, you have the option of, of displaying both units in the result file itself. So the fact that I'm on metric, I can click here and English units will be dually displayed. The only downside of doing that is it just takes more room on the screen, but really generally that's not an issue. So that one can be a good one you might like as well. So that's the M button up here. The next thing is this very top row here is what we call to be our quick start or our quick options here. The thing that's nice about this is things like, if we go to the view tab, here's another place we can change our units. Anytime there's a button, you can actually right click on that and you can add that to your quick access toolbar. So that's what I've done here to get the units up here. That way, if I'm in, my mesh and I'm changing something, I don't have to go back in order to change my units. I can basically do that up here. So anytime you see a button from for something, you can add it to the quick access bar. Other things that are important here on quick access bar, of course, the all important undo button, of course, redo. And if you want to undo multiple steps, you can actually select that for the uh, history. So those are really good there as well. Next thing we want to look at here, again, this is our sort of a standard Windows ribbon style of menu. Again, if I see geometry here, this will then go to my geometry tab. I can select either one of these. It will get me to the same place. I don't have to go back to the home tab to go to the mesh tab if I like. I can select directly on the mesh tab. And everything here is designed to be roughly a left to right approach, right? We want to import our part. We can set our mesh type. If we decided to a different mesh type than when we imported, here, it's very easy to change that. Uh, again, we can mess with geometry. We can mess with our mesh. 
whatever settings we want for the analysis sequence, materials, uh, again, left to right, we're ultimately moving ourselves over to results and potentially a report if we want to go there. Next, we look at the project area here. Again, in this case, I have my cell phone cover and I have multiple options and versions of the cell phone cover. If I then wanted to do not a cell phone cover, but a front bumper of my car, I would probably create a new project in a new instance of the software and not continue to just add them to the project pane because it would just get really confusing trying to find all of the files of all the projects that I might do. But within this, I can certainly do multiple versions of the cover all within this. Once we have one of these open, we see we can come down here to the study tasks. So these are all the individual things I can do to this specific study. And these settings that I select here might be different than the other studies that I've selected here. So down below here is layers. Whenever I import, we'll see that I get a folder for CAD geometry. I also get a layer for the geometry. If Let's see, let me open up one of these others. If I open up a new study, we'll see there's a bunch of layers here. The software does a reasonable job of sort of automating, creating different layers for you, but you're welcome to use layers in any way you like. You're welcome to put anything in any layer. You can move entities from one layer to another. Again, we can turn them on, we can turn them off. Makes it very simple and easy for us to use. If I don't like the look of this, I can turn my nodes off. Allows me to see the mesh on my part easier. Again, a lot of different things we can do here different ways to display what's ever in that layer. Again, I can, I can select items and move them to a different layer if I wanted. So lots of easy ways to do this. I can even find something that's on the screen. If I do the highlight layer, if I pick it, you will get this little box here that shows us what layer that's in. Uh, and the other way too, if I sort of put my mouse over this layer, we'll see that the mesh itself turned blue because it's sort of helping me find what's in this layer or what in this layer is displayed. The other thing we have, and I'll use this one that's already been solved, we have the log files. We can see the logs here. We can also see the log here. If I select this, I get a lot of information. It's just a text file, a lot of information of everything as far as settings um, and as it solved partial results throughout this, as well as different summary items at the end here. And it will also show solve time, whatever it took here. So that's the log file. The other thing, once it's solved, I also, also have results here as well that we can see and look at down below here. The one other thing that is hidden generally is if I right click, I can go to study notes. If I click this, I will get study notes and plot notes here. This would be something, you know, full analysis with cooling lines. I can type anything I like here. And what's really handy about having notes there is when I look over here, I can see down below, it's at the bottom of this study notes, full analysis with cooling lines. I can see, you know, copy study settings from, from a pre previous analysis. So if I open a project, I don't have to open every study to see what's in it. I can simply mouse over, see a little bit of information. And of course, if I've put anything in study notes, I can have those in there as well. So that's a basic overview of what we have as far as just the interface of the software. Let's talk about Mesh, what it is, why we do it. Oh, and in fact, before I even go there, Mesh is something that some people are very afraid of. And if you are one of those, the cool thing is you don't even have to mesh it ahead of time you can actually do something that we call a one-click analysis. We can import our CAD, we can orient it properly. Uh, so Z is the open close, and we can set an injection location directly on the CAD itself. We can set material, process conditions, anything else we wanna set, and we can actually click start analysis. The software will then, in the background, mesh the part and then solve the analysis and give us results. A lot of times you might not do that, but you might. So certainly nothing wrong with do that. But let's talk about if we do that step at a time and create the mesh, let's look at the mesh options that are available within Insight. So the first thing, there are three types that are used. One is a beam element. The second is a triangular or a shell element. And finally, a tetrahedral or a 3D element. And secondly, tied to elements, you always have something called a node. A node is the point at which defines the corners or ends of each element. 
So let's look at the different types. So again, in general, we're always going to start with a CAD model that got imported. And once we do that, we could do something called a mid-plane mesh. And I'll start there because it's the oldest meshing technology, been around for, well, a long, long time. And we'll talk about advantages and disadvantages of each of the three types of mid-plane, dual domain, or tetrahedral. So if we look at mid-plane, the shell element is a flat element. And what we want to in, end up with is elements that are basically at the midpoint or mid-plane of our thickness. So in this case, we have you know, our elements across the, the, the base of our part, as well as attached, you know, up to the, the rib. The challenge with creating a midplane, of course, is that we need to get those elements to the middle. So there are a few ways within mole flow. They're not the most robust, but they do work to create a midplane. Or you can actually create mid surfaces in a CAD package and bring them over and mesh them. The other option is there are other external softwares that will like automatically create a midplane for you that could be used and import the mesh directly into Moleflow is another way to do it. So once we have these here, the advantages now of a midplane is once we have our shell elements, the thickness is then actually an assigned property. So I could grab all the elements on the base of our part and say, well, you're gonna be three millimeters thick. And once I run that in the software, it's gonna know exactly what's there. And then the cool thing is if I say, well, what if I made the wall thickness thinner? What would that do? What would my pressures be? So I could actually go in, modify the property of three millimeters to be two and a half millimeters, and my new model is ready to go. I didn't need different geometry. I didn't need to go back to CAD. The downside sometimes of that though, is when we look at this rib, right? Ribs should be drafted. And so in general, you know, the, the thickness at the bottom of the rib is actually thicker than at the very top of the rib. And for a midplane, we need to go in there and actually assign different thicknesses at the very top, maybe across the middle of the rib, and then, of course, at the base to get the different thicknesses. Again, the advantage is if I have the need to change thicknesses across my part often, a midplane can be a very easy way because it's easy to select elements and just change the property of the thickness. So let's hop over then to the dual domain. A dual domain is very similar to midplane in that both use the same shell element but dual domain actually is what we would call, it's sort of a, a wrapped mesh. It takes the CAD and it puts a skin around the outside with mesh. And so we end up with what we would call basically a watertight mesh, where all of the elements connect to each other from one end of the part to the other and wrap around on the sides and the edges and everything. The advantage of a dual domain is from creation of a mesh standpoint, it's pretty easy because the software can wrap the mesh around the surfaces and since the software knows the elements are there, it's basically going to look for, if I have one element here, it's going to find something that's parallel to it on the other side of the rib. And once it does, it'll say, yeah, I found my partner over there. Therefore, what's my distance from me to that other element? And so dual domain, the software auto assigns all of the thicknesses for you, which is really great. The only downside to, well, two downsides to dual domain is, First of all, if we look at the number of elements of a dual domain compared to a midplane, it's probably pretty much twice the number of elements. And so the solve time will be longer than a midplane. But it's, it's generally still within reason. But that is one thing that, at least for me personally, I'd rather my computer worked longer than me working longer to create the mesh. The other time that, that dual domain is not a good choice is really based on the geometry. When we get to thick and chunky parts, sometimes the software has a hard time really differentiating for and understanding if my part is here, if it's really thick, the software by default is going to say, well, most plastic parts aren't thicker than, you know, a quarter inch or six millimeters. I mean, even that is probably really thick. You know, is this really the right thickness or is if it's thicker, you know, it might just simply go, I don't know what to do with these really thick parts. So then we would really look at something like the 3D or the tetrahedral mesh. Since there's no assigned thicknesses, it's all volume based. That is really where choosing 3D mesh is really good so because it's volume based. It doesn't matter how thick or weird transitions from thick to thin sections. It just does a good job. It picks that up sort of automatically based on volume, not on assigned thicknesses. I will say the one downside potentially to 3D is, of course, if you have to do modeling changes or thickness changes, you really have to go back to CAD, modify your CAD, bring it back, remesh, and then do something different. 
there are some things you can do within software to work around that to not go back to CAD, but certainly it takes extra steps to do that. Now, more and more, I see analysts using 3D for all things, not just thick parts or, and I shouldn't even say just thick parts, when I say thick and chunky, really, I'm, I'm kind of focused on parts that have lots of transitions from thicker to thinner to thinner to thick to, you know, lots of wall thickness variations. That's really where tetrahedral mesh does its best. And honestly, more and more people are doing even thin walled parts with tetrahedral. So all of the different mesh types have the right place and belonging. In the end, we'd like to solve it as fast as we can with a little amount of effort. So you're always sort of juggling that. Tetrahedrals also do take longer than a dual domain mesh to solve. But again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just computer solve time. So just be aware of that. The other thing, again, if we're going to do things like runner systems, you can use beams to define runners and gates for any and all of the different mesh types. But as far as gates and runners go, if it's not 3D, we would not recommend using a shell mesh to define gates and runners. But for 3D, you do have the option then to actually model it with full tetrahedrals through the part, the gate, and the runner system. So let's look, let's actually hop over to software and we'll look at meshing a part. So we'll come back to this one. We've imparted the part, but we haven't meshed it yet. If I come to mesh and generate mesh. So this is something that changed uh, about three years ago or so that the way that the software changed our mesh size. Uh, so here we see the default global edge length of 0.91, so just about a millimeter. It's kind of saying, well, the default then, what we would we would like is the elements to be about a millimeter across each side. But if we change this value by default, it won't actually change the way our mesh is created because we've changed to something that we call auto sizing. So use auto sizing as the new default in the software. Works great. It's a really robust mesher. And if we look at this, if we wanted to change our mesh size, we would actually go to the scale factor here. And scale factor is where the one then actually references this original value. Even if I change this value, typing something different here, the one would still reference the 0.091, no matter what I put in here. If I wanted to make a tighter mesh or more elements, I could decrease this to 0.75, would give me a much finer mesh. And if I said, you know, this really is just a quick run, I just need some basic answers out of this, I could make this 1.5, I can make it two to make it a much coarser mesh, will solve faster, maybe not be quite as accurate, but is still gonna be pretty reasonably accurate. And, and honestly, the values that I see most people use and that I typically use, I usually don't go less than 0.75. If you get down to 0.5, you start to get most of the time a pretty ridiculous mesh count, to be honest with you. And usually, so it's usually 7, 0.75 to maybe 1.5. On a rare occasion, I've gone all the way up to two. Beyond that, I certainly have never used it. If you ever wanted to go to the older style of meshing, you could go to use global parameters instead of the auto sizing. Now we would actually be using the global edge length and whatever value you type here. When we do that though, it goes to the older style. It's usually not as robust of a mesh. You typically have more mesh cleanup. So if we come back here, go to auto mesh sizing, we can then mesh this. Um, and I'll cancel this at the moment. It usually doesn't take too long to mesh, but I already have one that is meshed and we can take a look at our mesh. So here is the part that has been meshed as a dual domain mesh. Again, our dual domain is just a shell. It's a coating, again, around our part. So if I were to simply delete all of these, if we look inside of this, we will see that, yeah, there, there really is a nothing in the middle right? The elements just simply aren't there. It really is the shell elements on the outside. They are all looking for sort of a partner on the, in, on the other side. And then based on that, it auto defines thickness and calculates things appropriately. So once we have our mesh, one of the things that I always like to do is go to the mesh statistics and do a show. Once the mesh has been created, I just want to verify whether, and we can look at these down here. I can also click this and this will bring a pop-up to sort of show me the overall information. I want to learn what's, what is a good mesh and what's a not good mesh. And if there is something that needs to be cleaned up, then I would do that. If we close this out, if I do need to clean something up, like a, a, a high aspect ratio, which is really sort of our length to our height ratio, if I click this, the default here is looking for 
Any aspect ratio less than 20 is acceptable. So if, when I see this, a couple of things. If I look down below here, I see diagnostic generated one entity. I see that the, the aspect ratio of the entity is 28. It's above the recommended 20 that we would prefer. I can zoom out and sort of look for the spike. And I see that down here. The other way, if I don't see the spike, once I'm on a diagnostic, I can come up here. The diagnostic navigator shows up. I can click there. And the pivot of my rotation will now be centered along where that, that element is. So if I come up here and I say, oh, wow, look, sure enough, super long skinny, I can then use all of these different mesh edit tools to find this and fix this. In this case, I would simply do a merge node. We can see that that went away. We can see that the legend over here disappeared because now everything that's visible is better than 20. So there's really nothing else that I have to fix if I don't want. When I look at this, I do see some of these in this area are actually sort of long skinny, but they at least match the uh, you know less than 20 to 1 ratio. Therefore, I really don't need to fix them. Other ones I can look at here is thickness, and this will sort of show me what the software has auto-defined for the thicknesses. This can be a pretty, it's kind of a good way to sort of sanity check this. And if you're looking at dual domain, if you see some really strange results, that might lend you toward actually jumping over to doing something in 3D uh, tetrahedral mesh. But I can look across here and sort of see the thick sections. I can see the thinner sections. Turn our nodes off. And here we do see a few of these things that look a little funny, like is it really super thick to super thin? If we scroll down there, well, by golly, look at that. Based on the geometry, that really is real. Okay, I think I'm okay then. But if you ever see stuff that simply doesn't make sense, that might be the place to say, ah, maybe I should go to 3D actually. And over here, same thing, I might question this area. But if I rotate, I'll see, well, sure enough, that is actually a thick section. The other thing we can note, if we do look at mesh statistics, I'll bring this up one more time. And if we look at the very bottom here, it will give you sort of a hint, not suitable for dual domain, or it will say, okay. If it says not suitable, then your best bet, honestly, is to actually jump over and to run this in 3D. And again, so you might back this out, mesh it to 3D, a few different ways to do that. So I do have one that is meshed as 3D already. If we come over here, we can see the mesh is off in the layers, but let's turn that off second. If I come over to this end, again, if I do this same trick, let's delete all these. If I look in the end of this, we can see all of these tetrahedral elements just smashed in there. So that's so the way we know they're in there and we can see that. So we're gonna undo that because we didn't actually wanna delete our elements. Again, we can run a mesh statistics on the 3D. Because tetrahedra elements are very different than shell elements, there's actually sort of a lot less to look at here. We're still looking for maximum aspect ratio. We actually recommend it to be less than 100. So here we do have some that are exceeding what we recommend. But key thing for this, with the software meshes with a 3D tetrahedral mesh, we generally don't recommend that you actually fix anything. First of all, there's not a lot you can actually do to fix it. All of the mesh diagnostics are sort of gone from here. You can do the different mesh edit tools, but generally with the 3D, because there's so many elements packed in there, honestly, when you try to fix something, you tend to break other things. So we actually recommend that it isn't done, that you don't fix it, unless for some reason you try to solve it and it literally errors out on you. The other thing of note, if we look at the number of elements there's, in this case, there's a little over a million elements, which is sort of the other reason why we kind of don't recommend that you fix them. Because even the ones that are not good quality elements, there's probably not that many of them relative to the fact that there are a million elements. Let's see. So that is meshing. We cover full classes and give you more information on how to decide that. Let's jump into the process settings. How are we going to set this up? And really, before I go there, I want to bring up one other thing. 
This is a slide with way too many words. You don't have to read all these. But the point is, we really want to understand what our question is. What's the question? Why are you running this analysis? This will help you determine a lot of different things, and it will help you decide how you would even set up the analysis. It might even help you decide how you mesh your part. Again, if someone wants a really quick answer, I can give them a quick answer, but I probably need a coarser mesh that will solve faster. It will be slightly less accurate, but solve much faster. I'm comfortable doing that, knowing that odds are later I'll come back. There will be more specific questions. I will solve it with more of a, I guess, just average mesh versus a coarse mesh. And I know that I'll get, you know, great accuracy and good results at that point. So really, you know, is the park going to fill? Are there going to be air traps? Uh, is the cooling uniform? All those things are good things to understand and to know up front so you can know what and how to solve your analysis when you set this up. These are great questions. Doing them in the right order is helpful. I've literally had somebody walk up to me, hand me a part and say, hey, here's a part. We're having issues. Can you tell us the best place to gate it? It's kind of like, well, I, I can with the software, but really, if you already have a part, you already have a gate, you already have a tool odds are you're not going to want to move the gate. So maybe the question was something different, you know, or it was a great question. It was just six months too late. So let's look at this. When we look at this, we're going to start with what's the analysis sequence. Again, we have a lot of different options we can do. We can do fill, fill pack. We can do fill pack warp. We can do cooling, molding window, gate location. Again, what was the question? Maybe I can answer everything that was asked simply by a molding window, that's a super fast analysis to run. Maybe it's not. Maybe I need to run a cool FEM fill pack warp that's going to take me much longer to set up and much longer to solve. So we're going to look at this. The default is fill. After we've set up whatever we're going to do, we're then going to look at what material we're going to choose. Within Moldflow, within the database, there are over 11,000 materials in the database. And so obviously, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to find the material that's going to be selected. Every once in a while, you'll find one that isn't in the database. If it were me, I would contact the material supplier, see if they have it, and if they can send you that data. So we're going to select a material then, and then we, need, we do need a gate location then selected in order for us to solve something. Once we have at least those few things, we can then look at other things that we're going to do. And again, depends on what analysis we're going to do in the first place. One of the questions might be, where should I put my gate? If that's one of the questions, I could come down here and say, all right, well, we need to then actually look at running a gate location analysis. Once we do that, we're going to have specific process settings for a gate location analysis. There are different things we can do. There are yeah, a number of things we can do and set that up in order to help the, have the software help us determine where the best place to put the gate is. Once we do have that, in fact, here's an example of that. When we've run this, and again, a few criteria you can set up for that. But then I can look at the results and say, well, where is the flow resistance indicator? So it's basically showing in order to minimize pressure, my best gate location would be here. The worst location to minimize pressure would be out on this side. It at least gives us a good idea as to where it would be. Does that mean I should run it right here? Well, that's probably not likely a good location. You'll need to talk to your tooling expert to say, hey, what do you think is reasonable? If I see a result like this, I would probably put it maybe in here, but most likely sort of inside here to fill this. Again, talk to your tooling guy, have him help you to understand whether that's a good location or a bad location. Once we also run this, if we look at our log file, it will actually tell us the exact node location of where that would be. So we could run it based on that exact node location, or we could simply say, great, okay, let me find something that's in this area that I believe to be more toolable, and we'll go from there. So once we have selected the gate location, we can look at, uh, um, we could run a molding window analysis. This is really going to help us understand what process settings I should use. And again, in this case, if you know the process settings you're going to use or reasonably would be using, you don't really need to run this then. Or if you talk to the process engineer, hey, tell me how you typically run this. That would be another way to get this. If we look at the results that have already been run here, I can look at my zone plot. I can see the various temperature based on injection time, melt temperature, and mold temperature. If I look at my log, it will give me three values specifically, but I'm then going to actually take these with a grain of salt and kind of look at this to say, well, I see a large area here that's preferred. I can examine this and kind of say, well, preferred fill time is somewhere 
0.24 to about one. So if my fill time is anywhere in that, I'm probably going to be pretty reasonable. If my melt temperature is somewhere mid-range, and if my mold temperature is probably somewhere mid-range, you know, I might pick somewhere like this. So maybe 0.4 seconds, point something like that would be a good place to start my analysis. From here then, I can actually use that data, come over to an analysis, set it up that way, and actually run it. If we come back to this, we can set up a fill pack warp. We can come over here, let's add a gate location, put it there, and we can look at our process settings. So here's when we get our options right. What is the surface temperature of our mold? What is the melt temperature that will be coming out of the machine? We can look at the first stage or the filling control. We can do it via automatic. The software does some stuff in the background to come up with a reasonable value, or I can set an actual time. We saw based on molding window, 0.4 is a good place to be. We can look at how we're setting up our VP switchover. Again, it's, that's the switchover point from first phase to second phase or to pressure controlled. Automatic will get us close. I can also set a specific volume. The value that I know most analysts use is somewhere from 95 to 99%. Most use 98 or 99. Once we've switched then to our pack control, here we have options to set that for how long we pack and what percentage of our total injection pressure that we use, or we could actually do pack time versus an exact pressure. Again, with all of these, there are multiple options that we can set. And then of course, we wanna set our cool time, which sort of rounds out our cycle time. If we go to next, we can look at any options we might have for a warpage analysis. We can finish this. And then at this point, I can actually hit solve. So I can start my analysis. Let's look, am I in cloud or local? Let's go ahead and start this one local. And again, this is all, I haven't meshed it yet. All I've done is imported my CAD. I've picked a gate location. I've set some process settings. And the other thing I can do before I actually solve this, I can actually use something called fill preview. Fill preview is, you'll notice this is very fast. If I go to my results, I can look at my filling pattern. This is the only thing you get out of fill preview. You don't get anything else. You don't get pressures. You don't get weld lines. You can see them based at kind of the location. But this is kind of just a quick, if I put a gate here, how is my fill pattern going to move in a circular pattern out to fill my part? I could then move this, the fill preview will update, and we can then see roughly where my fill pattern is going to be. If I like that location, I'm going to go ahead and actually start this, and it'll start solving. So while that is solving, I do want to hop back here then to PowerPoint, and then we can look at results, right? So first of all, we'll cover this pretty quick here, but there's different types of results. Single data set is really something that's saying it's, it's a snapshot in time. So it's pressure at VP switchover, right? It's a snapshot in time. Intermediate results would be something like pressure that I could animate through time. I could find probably the exact same picture. I could find the same view in pressure that I could in pressure at VP switchover by animating and finding the right time step. We also can look at intermediate profiled, which is really looking at results through the thickness of the part. I can also get XY plots. I can look at highlights. I can look at text files a lot of different types of results that do come out of MoleFlow when we're done solving. Based on the analysis sequence that we've set, if we look at this, holy moly, look at all the different result types. There are a lot. And I've had people ask me this, wow, do I have to look at all of these every time? Absolutely not. It really comes down to, well, what was the question, right? What was the question that was asked when someone asked you to run the analysis? Based on that, I'm going to sort of look at certain things. If it's it has to do with will my part fill? I'm going to look mostly at my flow results. Will you know what was the the time to fill? It will show if it filled or shorted. I can look at pressure. I can look at temperatures. I could look at the clamp force required, air traps, weld lines, things like that. If I've been asked to look at the cooling, I could look at temperature of the mold. I could look at the circuit flow rates. Did I achieve turbulence in the circuits or not? If I'm looking at or the question was warpage. I could look at my warp results to determine is it within the range or within the values I need it to be or not. Within each of my results too, I can then modify and look at different results, different plot properties to change the way that it's shown in order to really understand and to really see the way the results are displayed. And there's two things I always look at. First of all, 
they need to be displayed for a way to, for me to understand them. And secondly, a way for me to show someone else, because I'm always showing someone else these results to make sure they understand them. So while this is solving, we actually see partial results going here. So I can actually see at 0.2 seconds, I'm 45% filled, and this is my pressure, and this is my clamp force. So let's come back to this one. Again, we have all these different results types. There will be more. I simply removed some of these so that it can be a little cleaner. So let's turn our channels off, get those out of the way. I want to look at my fill time. We can see here, we can animate this one. It will show us the filling pattern. We'll see how these parts are gonna fill. The other thing that we will often see is if it short shots or not. We could also look in the log file. I mentioned the log file earlier. That's where we sort of, and that was what was populating on the one that's still running. We can look at that and see if it, they will call out warnings if it's a short shot or not. The first time I look at results, I'm always looking at fill time and I'm usually animating this and letting this just kind of loop so I can see what's happening where. I want to understand how is this part filling. And I can always pause it and I can back it up. And based on this, I can see a lot of things, you know, what's happening on the bottom, what's happening on the back. In this case, it looked like it was good from the top side, but we'll notice also that this actually shorts because I see that it didn't actually fill. So other things that I would look at, I can look at the pressure. Does it exceed what my machine is capable of doing? Well, if it is, that's going to be a problem. I can look at temperature of flow front to see, you know, how much am I shearing my material? A lot of different things I can look at. Let's see warp results. I want to see how much does this part warp. I can look at this. I can take a look and see, you know, of these values, how close is this? Now, honestly, before I look too far in this case, because I got a short shot, I need to solve that problem first before I really pay too much attention to my warp values. But it's never a bad idea to kind of at least look and go, eh, at least gives me a ballpark early on. Where am I at with this? I mentioned plot properties. We can change plot properties to change the way that it's displayed. I could change from shaded to a contour. Contour result on a fill pattern is going to give us a much better view of basically looking at hesitations or race tracking, things like that. Okay, we can animate this. With 3D, it's a little looks a little more different because it's not just a single contour line, it's a contour surface. For mid-plane or dual domain, we get a, a true line. But again, because these are contour lines or contour surfaces, anytime we see surfaces that are closer or these, yeah, these contour surfaces are closer to other ones if the other ones are spread further apart, it's an equal time step between all of them. So that's kind of the way we see acceleration or hesitation in our parts. We notice as this is moving kind of through the bottom of the phone cover here, it's moving here, but boy, that sure is slow, right? We see those, we see those, those contour surfaces stacking up pretty tight, right? That tells me, hmm, boy, we really have some hesitation here. So, you know, those are the kind of things we can look at when we're looking at plot properties. Other things we can do, we can change the number of contours that are there. We can change the scaling. I don't know that I would change the scale and fill time, but maybe temperature, we can look at that. We can change scale maybe for the deflection results. If we're looking at multiple results at one time, hey, here's version A, here's version B. Let's show the results with warpage with the same scale. That way it's sort of easier to understand and, and see which one has less and which one has more based on color changes. Let's see, so we can stop the animation of that. We can take a peek back to see where's this, right? So even this already, we're at 81% full. so. It, it's, it's working its way along for sure. When we look at our results, one of the pretty slick things within MoFlow is if you click F1 for the help, which is a pretty standard way to get the help files for software, it will not only bring up the help files, but it brings you directly to the results that you have open. And I've actually, to be really honest, I've found the results for MoFlow or the help files to be pretty helpful 
they tend to show a number of things. They will give you sort of the generic, you know, description of what the result is, but they also give you some other hints, things to look for when you're looking at the result. So that can also be very helpful as you're getting familiar with MoFlow and the results that it gives you. So if you have other questions, we just brought up help files. If you Google MoFlow forums, you'll find those. You can contact technical support. We have some awesome engineers that if you, you know, basically contact them, Easiest way is typically through the web support through accounts.rds.com. You can set a time and they will call you and basically walk through whatever problem you're trying to work on. So those guys do a great job as well. The AKN, Autodesk Knowledge Network, you can go there. There's a ton of information available out there. Mofl IQ seminars have been put out for a number of years. If you actually just Google those, you'll find those out there. There is a YouTube Moldflow channel that's available that's got a ton of content out there. SimHub events, there are different events that occur, events like Autodesk University, events like the Moldflow Summit or the Manufacturing Summit. A lot of that content has been posted online and you can find that stuff out there. This is the really quick version. There is official Moldflow training. There is Insight Fundamentals that is a three-day course. Advanced Flow is a two-day course and Advanced Cool and Warp is a three-day course. Those are available potentially either through Autodesk or through our partner channel. And those are the full training classes available for Moldflow. And really the last thing I wanna leave you guys with here is the different technologies. So we've focused on injection molding, but I wanna throw out a few others just so people are aware that they are available. So while still injection molding, there is chemical blowing agents you can do, Mucel, Mucel core back, gas assist, compression, injection compression, we can do reactive materials, so we can go into thermal sets, by injection, microchip encapsulation, even you know metal injection molding or powder injection molding, other thermal sets, resin transfer molding. We can do conformal cooling versus just the standard cooling. We can even do stuff for mole flow to Helios or even API scripts, basically getting mole flow to FEA, taking the data, so the as manufactured data out of mole flow, getting it to your structural analysis to get you better more accurate results is also one of the really, really cool things you can do with MoFlow results. That is the only thing I have. I guess at this point, we will open it up to any questions that you have. I do want to thank you for your time and attention here.